Hi there, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, I think so, uh, judging from the, the smiles and the conversation we heard just outside. Well, we hope that you're well taken care of. Uh, and of course, a warm welcome once again to the International Safety at Sea Week 2022. Now, we're now down to the afternoon session, which is the plenary one and two. My name is Carissa Seat, and it's a pleasure to be your MC for this afternoon segment. Now, as you can see, the title of plenary one and what we're talking about is Dovetailing Seafarers Health and Wellbeing with a good safety culture. So I'll just do a quick check-in. How's everybody's health and well-being this afternoon? So far, very good. There's only that few things we need as human beings, right? Good sleep, good food, movement, great conversations and connection. Yeah? Okay, good, good. I'm glad that we're taking care of you. Um, so please let us know in the feedback form at the end as well what you liked about today. And of course, uh, join us all the way to the end to participate in the quiz and hopefully bring home that Amazon gift card for your shopping. Okay, so with that, as we jump into Plenary 1, we're just going to be opening up with um, announcing some of the winners of this year's International Safety at Sea Awards. Now, basically, we do want to give out and acknowledge this awards, um, and they are presented by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore every year to make sure that we really recognize the outstanding efforts of organizations as well as their individuals who have contributed towards ensuring safer seas. But before we do that, I'd like to ask for your kind attention onto the screens as we watch an awards introduction video. Let's watch. The NPA International Safety at Sea Awards recognize and celebrate outstanding contributions at both the corporate and individual levels. This year, a record number of nominations were received across the four categories, and entries were reviewed by the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council. Before we announce the winners, let us hear from Ms. Hua Le Hun, Chief Executive of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, and Mr. Ishak Ismail, Chairman of the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council. Dear friends and partners of Maritime Singapore, for this year's International Safety at Sea Awards, we have two firsts. We received a record number of 57 nominations this year compared to 27 last year and 45 in 2020. This is also the first year we introduced a new criteria so that Hubcraft, Pleasurecraft and regional ferry operators can nominate deserving individuals and organisations and we have received 10 nominations. This strong response is very encouraging. Safety at sea must be a key priority for all of us. So congratulations to all our winners Thank you for your commitment and partnership in making the maritime industry safer and international trade smooth sailing for all. Dear seafarers and all who are in the maritime industry, safety at sea is of utmost importance to all of us. Every year, we highlight acts of kindness and courage through the International Safety at Sea Awards. We also take the chance to recognize companies that have made maritime safety a core focus of their mindset. I am inspired by the stories of selfless rescue and examples of exemplary efforts in promoting a safety at sea culture amongst this year's winners. This year's winner in the individual category stands out as someone who has earned the respect of his peers by the way he has led by example and gone beyond the call of duty for his decades of work in the pleasure craft community. On behalf of the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council, we want to thank all seafarers for keeping our seas safe and my heartiest congratulations to all the winners. All right, and we will be uh, meeting the winners in just a while. For this, I'd like to invite on stage our Chief Executive of Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Ms. Kwa Le Hoon, to give out these certificates. Please welcome her, Ms. Kwa. And it's lovely to hear applause for all our recipients as well, so keep them coming. We're going to be starting with the outstanding contribution to search and rescue efforts in 2021. The first recipient is Executive Ship Management Private Limited, represented by Mr. S.P. Singh, Managing Director.
Next, we'd like to say congratulations to MTM Ship Management Private Limited, represented by Captain Nila Mohan Padi, Deputy General Manager for HSSQE. Congratulations. Our next recipient is Pacific International Lines Private Limited, represented by Captain Peng Chu Xin, Deputy General Manager, Quality, Safety, Security and Sustainability. Next, we'd like to present to STC Shipping Private Limited as owner and North Star Ship Management Limited as manager, represented by Mr. Okayasu Shigemi, Director of STC Shipping Private Limited. Congratulations. Our next award goes to Synergy Marine Group, represented by Captain Yong Ho Kim, Master of HLS Ember. Congratulations. Next, we'd like to present the award to TK Marine Singapore Private Limited, represented by Captain Siddha the Dioli, the Master Marina. Our next award goes to Tidewater Inc., represented by Mr. James Fortnum, Managing Director, Asia Pacific. Once again, well done to the outstanding contribution to search and rescue efforts in 2021. We'll move to the next category, outstanding contribution to safety at sea individual category. This goes to Mr. Edwin Lowe, General Manager Mentor of Changi Sailing Group. Chang I apologize, Changi Sailing Club. Congratulations. Thank you. I'd just like to appreciate the applause that's coming up from all of you. As you know, a moment on stage, but all the hard work has been done the entire year. Now we're going to be moving to the next category, the Outstanding Contribution to Safety at Sea Corporate category. The first recipient is Evergreen Marine Corporation Taiwan Limited, represented by Ms. Molly Mock, Chairman of the Evergreen Marine Singapore Private Limited. Congratulations. Next, we'd like to call upon Executive Ship Management Private Limited, represented by Mr. S.P. Singh, Managing Director. The next award goes to Pacific Carri Carriers Limited, represented by Mr. Ho Wing Yu, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. Next, we'd like to say congratulations to TK Marine Singapore Private Limited, represented by Captain Rohit Kapoor, Vice President of Ship Management. And our final recipient for this category to Thorn Group, represented by Captain Mayush Resh, uh, Jaya Dead the Marine and Safety Manager. Congratulations.
congratulations to all winners for this category. We move on to the open category, and I'd like to congratulate our first recipient, Anglo Eastern Ship Management Limited, AESM, uh, represented by Captain Vikran Malhotra, Managing Director for Anglo Eastern Maritime Services Private Limited. Congratulations. Next up, I'd like to call upon Ardmore Shipping Asia Private Limited, represented by Mr. Gerald Tan, Head of Commercial East and General Manager. Congratulations. And next, we'd like to congratulate Singtel Telecommunications Limited, Singtel Satellite, represented by Mr. Lim Kian Soon, Head of Satellite. <laughs> and final recipient for this open category, a round of applause for Yu Ming Marine Transport Corporation, represented by Mr. Vincent Pua, Senior Vice President of Yu Ming Marine Transport Singapore Private Limited. Congratulations once again to all our recipients. Thank you, Ms. Kwa, for giving out the awards. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as we acknowledge each and every one of our um, responsibility here to contribute to a safer uh, uh, culture out at sea. Uh, we do appreciate that you've taken time to really be here this afternoon to listen in, to engage, and hopefully we, we hope to enable you as well as you move out into your individual roles uh, back to your offices. Now that said, our first presentation is titled Communicating Towards Safety. Now a bit of background about our speaker coming up. Uh, his career included stints as Port State Control PSC Officer, uh, flag State Investigator, Safety Inspectorate with MPA of Singapore. So very diverse uh, experience and background. I'm very pleased to be welcoming on stage the Deputy General Manager, Head of Sustainability, Safety and Security from Pacific International Lines Private Limited. Please join me in welcoming Captain Ping Chu Sing. Captain Ping, over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, communication is a vital part of any safety management system. Besides the effectiveness of the procedures and safety of a crew and operation. There are various forms, familiarization, briefing, debriefing, seminars, webinars, team building, body system risk management, formal safety assessment, you can name it. And not to forget the partisan vote to allow the crew members to communicate. To ensure these are effective, there have to be two ways, open, levered, and continuous. Otherwise, you tend to fail. It doesn't. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the key was uh, open, respectful manner. Then you encourage everybody to more willingly to give, receive, give and receive feedbacks. So by doing so, then we can have the address, the challenges, problem statements to find practical ways to address them. Thirty years ago, we had bigger crew sites, slower pace, less intervention from the shore office. So we use post service. We make phone calls when the ship arrives at the port. Because if you make a call from the ship, it costs you five bucks per minute. We had radio officers, very old school, physical, tangible. A lot of efforts put in by every individual on board and ashore. 
We used to enjoy the parties, interactions, communication on boots. I remember I had a cabin mate roommate, a Burmese gentleman. We share a cabin on the ship. He made a photocopy of the love letter from his girlfriend posted to him. And that motivated him for seven months. He used to bring the letter on deck when he was on duty. And he used to read to me before I sleep, although I didn't understand because it was in native language. So that was how it was 30 years ago. And it's always we, less I. A lot of teamwork. By the way, these photos are from Facebook. Some of the guys I know, some I don't. We had parties for sign on, sign off, cross international date night, equator. Saturday, Sunday, a lot of bundings. There are sports games, football, basketball, table tennis competitions. We did crazy stuff. Stop the ship at sea anchorage, jump into the water for a swim. Right? We had barbecues. And uh, we went ashore by lifeboat. <laughs> and we had curdai orientation. For some of you have experienced that crazy stuff, right? I can't show the photos. <laughs> Very different today. Smaller crew size. We had a 10,000 TU shipment by 16, 13 people. You can imagine, do they really have time to interact with each other? Probably not. We have internet, good connectivity. But the problem is many of them are isolated. They don't talk to each other. They talk to the family thousand miles away, talk to the friends, update the Facebook, Instagram, but they don't talk to the guy next cabin. And that is the person supposed to make sure his safety and save his life. Very sad. This is what published by S1. So the question is, are we better communicated today? Not necessarily so. We need to communicate. We need to have effective, meaningful communication, right? To foster a team on board. To foster communication in the maritime community to address the problem. We should do everything we can to avoid falling into the trap, to be slaved by technology. We should use technology to empower our officers, our masters, our engineers and crew on board, but not to belittle them. Today, a lot of decisions are made ashore. And you have somebody have his hand on the trotter and tell the captain what is the RPM supposed to be run for a good reason, yes. It's part of sustainability, it's part of environmental uh, initiative, but we should not take the authority away from the master, and that should be clearly communicated. And we should use the technologies to better support, better communicate with our team on board, but not to take over the responsibility, not to make a decision for them. We are sitting in the aircon, but they are facing the storm. And we need to engage and use technology to better communicate, but not to be judgmental, right? There are occasions I've seen, and some of us not reminded, very often fall into the trap to ask the captain, why you are still in this course? We are not there to fear the bad weather. We are not there to face the storm, but they are. We need to make sure this technology are better used, provide more useful information, for example, weather, weather routing service, they're fantastic service. This should be communicated to the captain to make a better informed decision for the safety of the ship and the crew on board. Use the technology to connect, communicate, engage every single person on board, include the top management ashore to understand the leads, 
So over what is needed, but what is not what is look pretty. Sometimes the survey will, will be helpful. We ask our guys on board what actually you need. Instead, we'll do something look good on us, but not necessarily helpful to them. Communication with technology should build on competency and trust, not distrust. And we can never forget the captain and anyone on board. It doesn't matter how competent he is, how experienced he is. He may have 40 years experience. He's just another human. And being a human, he makes mistakes. He has fails. He worries when there's a situation. So we see the show, we're supposed to provide better support to understand them, to put itself in the shoes, to make sure this ship shore communication is effective. Try, when there's a situation, you get a call from the captain, ask him, how are you? Are you okay? Is your crew okay? Is this good time to talk? Instead of, we have seen some negative examples, tell me now. I want the details in 30 minutes. I got a call from the CEO, the management. I want to know. Or 10 minutes in some cases. This is not what you say just now. You told me there are 50 tons. How come now 70 tons? I need your answer now. This will give additional stress to the master and his officers on board can make the situation worse than it already is. My mentor once told me, and told me many times after that, happy wife, happy life. And this is especially true for seafarers. Without the support from the loved ones, life can be very tough and meaningless for the seafarers. When they know somebody's waiting for him to go home, and waiting for him to return to the family with love, he'll be motivated and encouraged. Otherwise, he's going to be miserable. We have seen bad examples. So many of the companies before COVID, they had allowed carriage of family. And I think with the COVID is over, when safety can be promised, we should resume that. So with the other half, understand exactly the challenges they have. They issue the face on board every single day. They'll be able to better support instead of just lagging about what happened at home. Right? I was very fortunate I had a family sail with me and my wife cried actually. When I actually went down to the cargo hold and DB Dang and came up and she was confused with where I was going. And when she came to know she had a bit better understanding of the, my work and appreciated a little bit more. And some of the companies that rent short staff, although they have no competency to sail on the ship, to sail as a supernumerary, to undergo study, training, formalization, to appreciate the difficulties they have on board, to better understand the operation requirements, so when they return to the office, they can provide better support to enhance the shipshore communication. And some of the companies have already started long ago, Wives Club. So they gather the wives of the seafarers to provide support, knowledge about ship operation so they can better understand and support the husband at sea. Of course, today we have many lady seafarers, so some of the husbands will better support the wives at sea. Food for thought. Many of the companies have gone dry long ago because charter requirements or a major. Uh, I think there's no right or wrong for good reason. But I think we should treat our seafarers as professional adults like we are. They should have the right to choose. A few years ago, I was asked by my CEO 
whether we should go dry? My answer to him was low. I asked myself, what is left there for the seafarers on boats? Not much. We have a barbecue party with uh, you know, chicken wings ready. Are you going to sit down with Coca-Cola? I don't know. A little bit of beer may be you know, very helpful. We did a survey. More than half of the guys decided we should have beer and boots. So we had until today. A good reason. I think we should continue to communicate as a closely community, regardless of nationality, cross border, cross border, because we have a common objective of ensuring good, sustainable communication to identify the problems, to find practical solutions together, to better support our seafarers, to ensure their well-being and safety. With that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Captain Peng, for that uh, delightful, insightful sharing there. And I'm glad that even as we move into uh, more technologically advanced uh, environments, we are still bringing back the human element um, in all of this and reconsidering what it means to be human in midst, um, you know, technology advancements. Now, in our next presentation, we'll be looking, it's titled, um, How Mental Health Management Shapes Safety Culture and Risk prevention. So a bit of background about our speaker that will be coming up. Uh, his expertise uh, has been in the research of the area of maritime stresses and psychological illnesses uh, to develop preventive measures specifically for the maritime industry. So we're very pleased this afternoon to be having with us clinical psychologist and founder of Mental Health Support Solutions. Please welcome Mr. Charles Watkins. Hi Mr. Watkins, stage is yours. Greetings, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I might be the odd one out here, so let me introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Charles Watkins. I'm the CEO and founder of MHSS. We started about five years ago now, almost. And we offer mental health support. We're the industry leaders in terms of mental health for seafarers and clinical professional psychologists to help seafarers around the world deal with all type of emotional distress crisis situations, and worse. Yeah. We do trainings, we uh, do support, but we also fly to vessels. We stay there, we support them on the vessels when things happen, we offer help for post-traumatic stress symptoms, but also general psychological first aid. So let's, let's dive into this topic. Mm -hmm. I've chosen this map because older seafarers that I've interviewed, they uh, still know about these maps or they <laughs> heard about them from their grandfathers, their great grandfathers. Uh, as you can see here, they uh, have monsters on them, right? And uh, they used to indicate areas that weren't explored, areas that were dangerous, that were hazardous, things you didn't know about. And those monsters aren't there anymore. We don't use these symbols anymore. But it doesn't mean that these monsters aren't there. Maybe not in terms of geography, mapping, but in terms of mental health. And I want to make sure that you understand that mental health is not something you readily see. It's not something you can quickly diagnose. It's often things that go on for a long time without anyone noticing it, okay? And a lot of people believe that these monsters are inside of them because they don't understand it, they're not educated about it, and they fear it. They fear seeming weak, they fear being unprofessional. Their fear is about being called unfit for duty, not being able to provide their family anymore. These are very real challenges that we face when we started out with trying to educate the industry, but also seafarers about 
the very real threats, but also the normalization of mental health issues. So please keep that in mind as we, as we continue. Mm. I could speak about many things, but I think lately I've noticed, or my team and I have noticed, leaders have a tremendous impact on the mental health on board. And I want to talk about that because it directly affects safety culture. Now, when I talk about culture, I mean work culture. I mean work environment. I mean how people come together and live the rituals and the beliefs and the laws, the regulations that are official and unofficial on board. When leaders are trained well, when leaders understand how important mental health is, how important it is to create an environment that is compassionate, that accepts people speaking up, and doesn't see mental health as a weakness, but sees mental health issues as things we all need to go through in life. None of us are immune against these things. We all have them. We all have bad days and good days, some worse than others. And I'd like to draw attention to a culture that understands to allow mistakes to happen to learn from them. The most resilient vessel that we've experienced, especially during the COVID period, are vessels that understood how to promote a healthy environment by not punishing every mistake that is done, but by learning from them, taking people together saying, hey, what happened to you today? Okay, let's learn from it. Let's bring people together. Let's prevent it in the future. A healthy way of dealing with mistakes is a way to prevent accidents. When people are afraid to speak up, that's when things get worse. If people are afraid to say, hey, I don't think that's safe, or have you, have you seen that? Maybe we should move that before we start working. When people feel free enough, safe enough to say that, we can prevent accidents. And it has all to do with work culture and how the leader affects this work culture and without the mental health on board. Several seafarers have told me the hardest contracts, and this was interesting, I, I, I had no idea about this. I, was one, I thought hard, the hardest shifts or the hardest jobs were people dealing with emergency situations or horrible things that happened on board. But they actually said the hardest contracts were those with people in, in charge or leaders that were very difficult to deal with, that were very hard, that were unfair, that were bullying. Those were the hardest shifts. And there used to be this notion of to silently suffer. I really want to stop that notion. I really want to break free from that. That is the past. Many of you probably have gone through that, and I respect that, and I understand that. But now, with a new generation, I would like to try to help them speak up and break that silence. So as I try to, to explain, when we talk about a culture of excellence, a safety culture, we are trying to understand how the group dynamic, how the resilience of the whole is influenced by certain types of factors, okay? So, if concerns are heard and dealt with quickly, it's the same thing in medicine as it is in psychology and mental health. The earlier you deal with the problems, the better the prognosis, the better you can actually solve something, the more easier it is before it gets out of hand, okay? So when conflicts are dealt with in a, you know what, let me put it this way. Never avoid conflict, move into conflict. It's good to catch it early and to solve it. That's the, I think that's my main point, yeah. Don't avoid conflict, move towards conflict, because then it can be solved before it gets worse, before it gets big, before it might create 
something worse than just an accident or a concern. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, people have to be trained. You have to know about this. People, leaders have to understand what does it mean to be a compassionate leader? Am I weak with that? Am I stronger with that? Yes, you are stronger with that. You're allowing people to understand that you lead with compassion. That doesn't mean that you're not a good and strict or a competent leader. No, it means that you understand how important it is to understand when people feel safe and secure to speak up, you will hear about things before they turn into problems. When people are fatigued, when people are bullied, people will speak up for them. And that's what we're trying to instill. That's what we're trying to change here. Um, every training I've given on every vessel that I've been, even, even on, on, the, on the oil rigs, there was never one seafarer that hasn't experienced bullying or witnessed bullying. It still is a problem. It's very real. And with this culture of, of, of excellence, culture of care, we're not going to eliminate it. That's not the goal. The goal is to have people speak up early enough to prevent things from getting worse. I've been to several vessels where people have committed suicide because of bullying. It's a very serious issue. And that's why it's very important to understand how conflict management and how uh, creating that culture of care through proper training and skills and leadership can really prevent most of the issues to pop up in the future. So there are things, of course, that we've seen in the past that mistakes that are often made, right? It's often about ego. It's about power. It's about feeling insecure when you're trying something new or believing that you might seem weak. It's quite the contrary, actually. These are all issues that can be addressed with awareness, with psychoeducation, with understanding of how sometimes we may feel like we're not good enough, worth enough, when in reality, actually, it's just our own insecurities telling us that we should act a certain way when you don't really have to. Empathy, compassion, patience, these are skills that define every strong leader. Um, so it's the direction we need to move into. And we need to start educating. The sooner, the better. We, as human beings, we grow from the stories of challenge, from the stories of struggle. When we're dealing with emergent situations, with mental health issues. Those are the things that shape us, that, gives us, that give us our depth. So we can relate to others, we can show compassion, we can show empathy to others. It's not weakness when we deal with mental health issues. It's strength because that's what we all have to go through in one way or another. Some people need more support than others. And support is a good thing. The newest studies show that just offering support, if you offer support to someone else, or if someone else offers you support, yeah, goes Bidirectional, you actually care for your cardiovascular system. Hormones get released. Oxytocin gets released, which is a major, major player in, in decreasing cortisol levels and other levels that aren't very healthy for in chronic states. So supporting each other is how we actually stay healthy and resilient on a very neurobiological level. The reason I'm focusing on leaders is because, again, they dictate the tone of voice. They dictate the environment. They dictate how you feel on a vessel, how you feel in an office. They can normalize mental health for everyone, taking away the stigma, taking away the fear of people wanting to speak up. And that's a beautiful thing. They can break the silence. And they can create a whole new world of change by just the way they act every day. So, Showing up and helping people understand how vulnerability is a strength, not a weakness. 
And last but not least, I would like to use these couple of second, seconds to, to thank everyone who has called, everyone who's supporting people on board, everyone who has broken the silence, everyone who's taking that leap of faith and believing in that we can change this environment, we can change this world to a better world, less accidents, more people being heard, and taking this topic with the seriousness it deserves. Yeah? Mental health, physical health should be one. And thank all of you for taking the steps in the right direction. I was very happy to hear about the uh, previous presentation. It put a smile on my face, so thank you for, for caring. That's not something I take for granted nowadays. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Can we keep you on stage um, as we prepare for the next panel session? I'm going to invite you to your seats. Um, or we can get some help with the ushering as well. Thank you. We're going to prepare for the panel, and you're one of the panelists. So I'll get the ushers to show you to the seat, please. Um, and we'll start with introducing the panelists for this next uh, segment here. A lovely segue into how um, opening a dialogue on health and well-being. It's not that separate after all, and that conflict can be a source of data. So that said, I'd like to uh, welcome back uh, Captain Peng Chu Sing to join us on stage. Um, we'd also like to welcome Ms. Sig Ha Singh, the Deputy CEO for Executive Group of Companies. Join us on stage. Captain Hari Subramaniam, the Regional Head, Business Relations and Medicine. Ship Owners Club. Good to have you. Dr. Faisal Qasim, Medical Director, Primary Care Division, Fullerton Health Group, Singapore. And we're happy this uh, plenary will be moderated by Honorary President at the Nautical Institute Singapore, Director of Loss Prevention for the Standard Club and member of the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council Singapore, Captain Eve Vanderbom. Welcome. We'll just allow our panel to kind of settle in a little bit and I'll, I'll share with you how you can be part of this panel session. Some of you might be familiar already, but take out your phones and what you can do is scan the QR code that you see on the screen to participate in the online questions that you can submit to our panel here. Or you can also put in www.pigeonhole.at. The event passcode is safety at sea. So our moderator, uh, Captain Eve, will be looking through, Captain Eve van der Bom will be looking through all your questions and at the selective and uh, good points. These questions will actually be answered by our panel session, panelists on stage. Okay, so with that, I'm pleased to hand over the time to you, Captain Eve van der Bom. Thank you. And it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm trying to juggle two iPads here and a phone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be back in person at these conferences. It's so much nicer to be able to see everyone and to do this in, in person instead of only seeing me from uh, the waist up. Um, as was mentioned by the MC, please do submit your questions. I would be really happy if we can get a lot of questions from the audience that we can ask this really great panel that we, that we have here this afternoon. I understand also from the virtual audience that uh, there are a couple of actual seagoing ships hooked up to this conference. So I'm looking forward to getting questions from the crew on board of uh, these ships. Now, when we are talking about uh, seafarer well-being, I, I found the two opening presentations really interesting. The, the topic of communication is something that we are definitely going to touch on during this panel discussion and the mental well-being is a very important what you mentioned on, on how leaders should behave. I thought that was really interesting. Now we all know that seafarer well-being has been an, an important topic for a long time. We've all known that we have to put more attention on mental well-being or well-being in general. But during the pandemic, and maybe that is a bit of a silver lining to, to the whole story of, of the pandemic, at least it has been put properly in a spotlight. We all now know how important well-being is. Sadly enough, we have lost a lot of people due to this, but it, we, we are seeing a change now. We are seeing um, operators that are putting more emphasis on the well-being. We can see them be it through, through the crew changes used, be it through communication and internet um, availability on board, be it through better accommodation, physical accommodation, better mattresses, better um, 
recreational facilities on board, at least we are seeing a step forward in the whole topic of well-being. We've also seen that there are changes to the MLC, which are coming into force. I'm not going to go into discussion on those. There are people who feel that it should have gone further, but at least it is a step forward. At least something is being put into the MLC for the well-being. Now, what we want to try and focus on in this panel discussion is how is the well-being linked to the safety culture on board? How is it affecting the, the safety of the vessel? Because if you are having a seafarer who is not physically or socially or mentally well, that will directly affect the safety culture on board. So those are a few things that I, that I wanted to talk about. But before we do so, we asked you all a question during the registration. And if I could ask that the answers of that question are put on screen. The question that we asked you was, in your opinion, which is the one area that a ship manager should focus on when it comes to seafarers' health and well-being that would directly improve safety culture on board? And these are the results, and I found these quite interesting. 41% of respondents have focused on the physical well-being. I'm sure Dr. Faisal is going to be really happy with that. Um, and we are going to come back on that uh, during the, the panel discussion. But interestingly, a quarter of the respondents are talking about the shore staff awareness of shipboard operations. And I'm actually really happy with that. And this touches on the communication discussion that Captain Peng was talking about earlier. And what we often, if, if I'm wearing my club hat, what we are seeing quite often is that there is a disconnect between people operating the ship, not the technical managers, the operators, and the people on board. So I find it really important that that is put up as a, as a quarter of the, the respondents. Now let's touch on the physical well-being first. And we know how physical well-being, how, how important it is. If, if you're not healthy, there is a risk to the safety on board. We all know um, the importance of the enhanced PMEs that are in place by the majority of the clubs compared to the basic PMEs that are mandatory by flag. Now, if I can come to you first, Captain Harry, um, you are in charge for MediC, which is operated by, by the Ship Owners Club. And from, from your perspective, we know that it, it is reducing the, the illness, the number of illness claims that we are seeing. Why is there still a reluctance from so many ship operators to join up with these enhanced schemes? Yeah, thanks, Yves. Um, just a little preamble, the MEDICI is actually an enhanced pre-employment medical scheme to start with. Um, and I think that addresses uh, the answers of our poll quite well. So firstly, in uh, line with um, the theme of today's plenary, dovetailing seafarers' health and well-being with a good safety culture, it's important to correlate how physical health um, you know, and safety culture go hand in glove. I'm going to give you a small example, like um, suppose I have um, an elevated heart problem and I've got high blood pressure or maybe I've got an abdominal pain or something and I'm going to be sitting here wondering which doctor do I see, Do have I written my will as yet, um, you know, um, for back pain what do I put, hot press, cold press and I'm going to be sitting here thinking about this and I've not even heard Eve's question. That just shows lack of focus, that just shows if you're not physically at ease with yourself or if you're body parts are not working optimally. Sorry, it's not very medical <laughs> language. Uh, it's more of technical shipping. But um, it just shows that probably this can lose a lack of focus. And um, that's where I think um, a seafarer is no different from a normal human being. So when he's working on board and he's not focused on his job, uh, he's going to be thinking of all the other things on how he can make himself better. Um, he's probably going to not follow procedures, not focus, and this could lead to some accident which can endanger himself or his life and all the people working with him because it's all not a solo performance on board and this gets classified as an injury this doesn't get classified as an illness so we have sufficient um, statistics review of claim files to show and i'm sure eves you'll allude to this that 
quite often the deep down the starting point is actually physical health and this is something which then affects the person's mood his fatigue his rest everything and lack of focus because we know our seafarers have access to everything nowadays you need to ask anything you'll just go alexa or google and it'll give you an answer but of course we've got so many online training programs exactly to take that um the biggest challenge to answer the question is actually changing mindsets now everybody is in their comfort zone and there's this very fine equilib equilibrium the supply and demand of seafarers and with covid it's become even more personified everyone's so worried if you kind of it's already very fine it's so expensive to have crew changes now if suppose i have earmarked a seafarer and i don't get him then you know that's going to lead to so many cost expenses and a lot of other things so that's the main thing uh, people do ask what's the catch when the club is actually investing money in doing this we pay over 50 dollars per seafarer to get this enhanced scheme and they are wondering what's the fine print nothing is for free you know so there must be something which you're not telling me and they try to kind of start doing a reverse engineer or a post post mortem but then it takes some time for them to come in and then they realize and i think the word of mouth um, spreads one last point i'm going to take is people are worried about seafarers they've been employing for a very long time like i've got a seafarer who's been sailing with me for 30 years and along comes your scheme and suddenly makes him unfit but we have sufficient data to show that the elder seafarers are the healthier bunch the one over 50 and we have about 75 76 year old people also who we've conducted the medical they are the healthier bunch the younger generation from the age of 30 to 50 are actually in the red zone they are the ones who are coming with added stress they are the ones who are coming with uh, you know anxiety issues cholesterol problems and i think it leads to a lot of things like um, food panda grab you know you want mcdonalds you just dial you can have mcdonalds thrice a day i used to beg my dad please can i have mcdonalds and you know if i was really a good boy i would get it at the end of the month but here people have it three or four times a day it's cheaper than organic healthy food i mean you go to the organic section and you can just see bitcoins like flying all over the place but if you want to buy mcdonalds is under 3 or 4 bucks so <coughs> plus we have these mobile devices which um, is the bane of everything or the boon i don't know but um, people want to rather invest in this the time and rather go out for walks and play i tell my son you want to play something i what i mean is we can go out and play some badminton he'll say sure you log in and i'll log in and i said no no that's not what i meant so there are a lot of myths over here which uh, ship owners are apprehensive about and i think um, forums like this discussions like this is where we can actually bust these myths and then once we are over that then it's all in the right direction thank nice. you thank you captain harry and if if i can come to you ms sika um from executive group perspective what what are your thoughts on enhanced pmes and also more widely on the the topic of how can we improve the physical fitness of uh, the seafarers on board yeah thank you very much james and good afternoon to you all um from executive uh, group perspective um if you are talking about this uh, um it is mandatory that every uh, ship Uh, a seafarer that we put on board he needs to go through a very strict uh, medical examinations and uh, we have enhanced it to the extent that we know there certain diseases or certain um, medical ailments are common and we have extended those tests as well so that every seafarer who goes on board he has gone through it and we have put a very physically fit person on board that is uh, it's well beyond the normal mandatory whatever medical examinations norm normally is done on board is very uh, uh, different uh, things like uh, the people uh, our health wise they have these uh, uh, we have the on on our panel the doctors they can 24 by 7 they can contact for any kind of medical ailments and plus we have also uh, concentrated on mental health we have on board on uh, not on board on on our uh, on, on our offices we have psychologists and uh, they are available for giving any kind of uh, uh, counseling on board and they have going forward we have also uh, launched a program called the uh, goodwill ambassadors those are the top four officers on board and they are being trained by our psychologists so that they are the they are the front and they can identify who have got any medical uh, and mental issues and they are the first one to identify them and they can give it over to the psychologist so we have ensured that the people seafarers that we put on board are always healthy 
and they have any health issues, they have immediate support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sika. And if I can come to you, Dr. Faisal, um, from your perspective, Fullerton and Health Group is get, gets involved when things go wrong. You are involved um, on the PME side as well, I understand, but you get involved when things are going wrong on board. Now, if I remember from, from my sailing days, um, telemedicine was something we tried to do over VHF with a very broken uh, connection. I think it has changed. It probably has improved. You are having video calls on board of ships now. You can have a much better um, remote analysis of, of what the issue is with the seafarer. But in your, in your opinion, how can we further improve telemedicine? And what are your thoughts on 41% of people saying that physical well-being is important? Right. Uh, thanks, Steve. So I'll answer that in two parts. I think the first part about telemedicine, um, that is just one piece of the management of health of a seafarer or for anyone in particular. Um, it is now evolved. Um, connectivity is obviously integral. And, and yesterday we've heard about the 5G uh, you know, initiative. This is well and good. Better reception, better audio and video feeds gives the doctor a bit more confidence in diagnosing and advising. Um, but we need to also decide or rather think about what is the next step, what's the next mile after the diagnosis, after the advice. Is there any other room or any other things that we need to look at, like maybe work with another allied partner, maybe with a men mental health psychologist, if let's say we detect something else beyond the physical ailment. Um, do we need to also, we probably have to figure out how to enable um, accessibility for these medicines, like delivering medication to maybe ships in the anchorage. I mean, we've talked about drones, we've talked about all these uh, IT capabilities, which are probably the next step of a 2.0 version of telemedicine, right? And I think the th third piece is also taking a leaf of yesterday's talk about collaboration. I think what's, what's important that the shipping industry needs now is reliable medical providers that can connect, that can share medical data to ensure that the seafarer's health is managed continuously. It is not just a one-off um, you know, consultation and that's it. There needs to be follow-up, there needs to be data capture, so that wherever you sail to, whether, where, whichever port of call you go to, or whether in you know, shore leave location, you know, everything is still consistent. So that is the bit about telemedicine, how we can evolve, how we can manage better uh, uh, the, the seafarer. Um, going back to this 40, 41% physical um, uh, uh, so-called emphasis, right? So I think just to draw back, I think it's not rocket science to understand that to have safe, safety and efficient operations, you need healthy and well individuals, right? So, and, and, and just to share WHO's uh, definition of what is health, right, is that it must be physical, mental, and social well-being in an individual with or without the presence of disease. Meaning there are two parts to this. You've got your three components, physical, mental, and social. And there's also that caveat that actually disease, the presence of disease is not important to determine or label someone as healthy. Right? So meaning if you were to, 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 to hire a seafarer, you're taking a seafarer, if you do not invest in a robust uh, pre-examination that caters to the multitude of diseases and also mental health, maybe a screening tool of some sort, Right? You might be, you might be uh, uh, even if you think that they've passed all this with flying colors and you don't invest in like what Madam Sika mentioned in terms of being able to detect certain things on board, then you will be actually onboarding seafarers that are inherently not healthy under the WHO's eyes of, you know, of health. And things may develop later, stresses, mental health, and maybe undiagnosed uh, chronic diseases may come up. So again, tying in with telemedicine, I mean, it should not be only seen as an acute remedy, an acute consultation, but it can also be leveraging, being leveraged on for, for chronic disease management. You can do teleconsults on, on blood pressure. You can do a finger prick and, and show the doctor on telemedicine your diabetes control. And then we sort out the last mile in terms of supply of the chronic disease medicine. So these are the kind of evolution that I think is, is potentially you know, a, a present that we can focus on for this industry. Thank you. And if, if I'm going to take one of the questions here, and I'll put this up to um, Mr. Charles first. 
Um, there's a question, if we can pop that on the screen. Um, because we are doing the physical health screening, we are doing medical examination at the moment for seafarers. And you touched on this, Dr. Faisal, in, in your comment just now. But should we require um, or should we consider doing psychological testing as well at the PME stage? And uh, Mr. Charles, if I can get your thoughts on, on this first. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a good question. Should we require seafarers to go through psychological assessments after the medical or before? No? I think, yes, of course. Me being from the profession, we've been doing this for quite some time. But I have to say it is scary for some seafarers. Some seafarers are afraid of it. Some people know it's what to expect. They might be nervous. They might present differently. So the results, you have to be careful with with what you're doing, you have to know about. You have to know about cultural understanding of psychology. What are the fears, and then you can adjust it properly. So, I think uh, educating people about what the what the assessment is there for to do, it's to help people to catch people that may not be so fit or should maybe not go out to sea right now, yeah, because they're not in the right space of mind. That's it. It doesn't mean they can't go later. I'll give you a perfect example. About four or five months ago, I had an assessment and I was talking to the seafarer and <clears throat> he, he was in extreme distress and um, he didn't want to talk about it, but after about 30, 40 minutes, he shared a couple things with me that was worrying him. It was simple things, like he needed to, he needed to purchase a, um, a, a car for his, his wife for shopping. He needed to do this, he needed to do the insurance things. I mean, very simple things, but they were stressing him. They were stressing his wife. And he was not, he, he said, well, I'm not really ready to go right now, but I need to go. And I don't want to, I don't want to lose my opportunity. I said, it's not, not a problem. This test doesn't, doesn't cancel you for future voyages or, or any future contracts. So what I did was I explained to him the procedure. I said, Let's, let me put a waiting period of two months. Is that enough for you to get your things organized? I said, yes, that would be great. That's what I did. Two months later, we did the test again. He presented differently, perfectly fine, ready to go, and not worried about all the little things that were important to his wife and his family and to him. So I just want to try to take away the fear and the uneducated part about these tests. They're there to catch people that are not ready to go out at sea, that may be stressed, that may be worried, that are not in the right space of mind. They're not there to take people's right away to go to sea. I think that's the main thing I want to say. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Charles, for that. Um, if, I'm, if I'm moving on a little bit, we recently saw the release of the second quarter of the Mission to Seafarers Happiness Index. And I was quite happy when I saw the results because there was a positive increase across all of the 10 questions that uh, the happiness index is asking each time. But still, there was room for improvement. I think maybe it was because of the changes to the MLC that the crew is, is feeling happy and was giving a positive survey, maybe because of improved communication on board. We don't know exactly the reasons why, but at least there was a positive increase of the happiness index, which I think is really good. Now, some of the items are still scoring quite low on the happiness index. One of them is shore leave. It is a difficult topic at the moment because there are still a lot of restrictions in place across certain countries around the world where uh, the authorities are not allowing shore leave to take place. And Ms. Kwa was referring to it yesterday uh, during the, the opening session. It would really be good if worldwide seafarers are allowed again to go back ashore. Now, never mind that part, we can't control that. What we can control from a ship operation and a ship management perspective, and this is the sad part, we still see some companies that are not allowing their crew to go ashore, even in countries where it is allowed, because they are afraid of the potential risk of one of the seafarers getting COVID, bringing it back to the ship and delaying the whole ship. But that is directly affecting the well-being of those seafarers on board. 
So I, I want to put that question to uh, Captain Peng, because PIL is having a very busy liner service. Yes, um, you are very busy in, when, when your ships are in port, but what are your thoughts on, on shore leave and, and how this can be, can be dealt with, with the restrictions? I think it's very clear to us, uh, shore leave is, uh, is a right of seafarers. It's not a privilege, right? And whenever this can be safely done, the fence sanity should be provided. Uh, the advantage we have is we have overseas office in almost every port we go. So we have the local office to support us when we need to. And uh, we have opened up shore leave uh, in almost everywhere except China for obvious reason. <laughs> so uh, our crew members are allowed to go ashore and when they are in need, they can uh, you know, contact our local colleagues to get assistance uh, when they're in a foreign port. Uh, I think Singapore has done a very good job, MPA, allow shore leave together with uh, some of the leading ports in the world. I, I think we need to uh, make it very clear to the policy makers, authorities, to make sure that they need to provide this to, to our seafarers. Uh, it has been just too long, two and a half years, three years. Uh, some of them serve long contract, extended contract because uh, logistic, logistic challenges and basically it's a floating prison for some. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not really appropriate to put it in that way, but uh, it is how it is, right? So we need to understand the lease of seafarers. We need to support them to let them go ashore, uh, you know, rewind themselves and come back and work safely. Thank you for that. I've, I've put up this question. I, I'm not sure if this is something that we from the panel side can can answer because it's it's uh, this master on board of the Atlantic Altamira is asking if if authorities are making it easier. Well, I don't know how to answer that from from our side, but I'll put it up because we are talking about uh, shore leave. But uh, Ms. Sika, if I can come to you on on how are you dealing with with shore leave for your fleet? I think whenever it's allowed, I mean, there is no reason why their shore leave is, should be denied. But I understand that the COVID and there are situations where probably it is not convenient or it is not safe enough. So we need to consider those uh, issues and accordingly. But in principle, there is no reason that we should uh, deny the show leave. That's not, not as a policy. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, if we, if we take it one step further, and um, I'm coming to, to Mr. Charles again, um, because from your, the helplines that, that you are operating or similar helplines that are available to, to seafarers, you will immediately see the result. If something goes wrong on board of the ship, if there is a, um, a seafarer that has um, a problem, they will be calling, well, hopefully, um, these helplines. So from, from your perspective, how do you see um, how the mental well-being, certainly as a result of COVID now, how can this affect the safety culture on, on board of, of that particular ship? And if I can put immediately a second question to you as well, <laughs> um, is there anything that, that we can tell the ship owners and the ship operators, is there a way that we would be able to recognize these symptoms in a seafarer? How are, how is a ship owner able to, to help out a seafarer? How can you recognize it before um, the person goes, goes missing, basically? Please. Yes, thank you. So to answer your first question, many issues have popped up because of it. Uh, it's interesting because Seafarers are actually used to extending their contracts or having to go a little bit longer when it's necessary. I don't think it's about that so much, that aspect. What I want to highlight is, is what they've told me. And that's the aspect of disappointing the people at home, their family, their loved one, their friends, again and again and again. That's what gets them angry. That's what gets them upset. And as you can imagine, if there's something that's seriously wrong at home, if someone's in the hospital, if something bad has happened, then that, of course, magnifies everything. Yeah? So there's anxiety, there can be panic attacks, there's isolation, depression. Uh, and these people need support. They need, 
what I talked about, a good support on the vessel, which is most important, and then access to professional psychology that can help them manage with some of these difficult emotions. That's it. And to answer your, your second question, what can be done? How do we recognize that? I could explain to you meticulously how to recognize these things, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't serve the purpose of the question. So to answer the question, I would say there has to be proper clinical mental health basic training for leaders, for officers, for people that are on the vessel to recognize these symptoms. It's that simple. When they can see it, when they've trained to see it, when they train to speak up and look at different aspects of it, that's where they can reach out to people and help them and support them before they go missing, before it's too late. So to give a very short and simple answer, there has to be psychoeducation in place, training in place for the right people on board so they can recognize it before it's too late. And it's that simple. And uh, again, if they have access to professional psychologists, to clinicians, they can give them a call and they can ask, hey, I've been witnessing this and this behavior. What do you think? It's the same thing they do when they have an accident on board. If someone's bleeding and say, hey, I've got um, a wound uh, here. He's cut in this area, they call. And, and you say, well, you know, patch it up to this and that. It's the same for us. It's like, all right, this is what he, this is, these are the symptoms. All right, it sounds like he's going, th going through this. You need to do one, two, three to make sure he's safe. And then let's talk again tomorrow. So it's both training and access to a professional consult. Yeah? People shouldn't be left guessing especially not with medical or psychological uh, issues. They should have proper support in place. Thank you. Thanks for that. And, and that answer I, earlier, I briefly put up one of the questions before it disappeared. There was a question on, on uh, suicide from one of the, the captains and what can be done on, on how to uh, deal with it. But you, you will have answered that at the same time. Ah, there it came back. I love these things, they are magic. <laughs> Suddenly my questions come back. Um, so I think we will have dealt with this question as well. If we move on from the mental well-being part and we go towards the social uh, well-being, we know it is important. I would say even more so, probably, I feel. If, if there is no social interaction on, on board of a ship, if, if you do not create um, a link between your seafarers, because like in, in the pictures that, that Captain Peng was showing earlier, where everybody disappears into their uh, cabins or, or go and, goes and sit in a corner, how do you create um, a desire to help out your fellow seafarer on board? You don't, not in my opinion anyway. Um, so I think that that is something we, we, that we need to work on is that social cohesion on board. Now, of course, we cannot go all the way the other side and say, no, you can't have internet anymore. You can't have your social media and your video calls. I need you to have barbecues and beer with your fellow seafarers on board. I know that we can't, but it is about finding that balance between the two parts where you give them the internet on board, you also make sure that there are ways for them to socialize on board. And if I can come to you, uh, Ms. Sika, how, how do you deal with social interaction in, in your fleet? Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the very important uh, issue that uh, nowadays and it's across the industry, you hear about that uh, there's a social interaction is uh, diminishing and that's I think Captain had already showed us the, in, the, in his uh, presentation. And that's a real issue. Uh, but then what we are trying to do is that in encouraging all the masters, all the top management on board to create a lot of activities and which from the shore we initiate a lot of things like a lot of competitions, a lot of uh, uh, any festival. Uh, so that's a time we, we find that and we tell them that we, they need to, uh, all these presentation, all these uh, competition entries they need to make a group, not less than five in number. So they be and, and ensure that whenever the all presentation, all the entries come, 
they make their own group. It doesn't matter which, which uh, department they belong. They can be from a uh, uh, captain to uh, with, a, with a cadet or whatever it is. So that it's a kind of we are encouraging from the shore side that any kind of activities, they should continuously do it on board along with their own work. So that's, uh, we find that uh, when we encourage them to do it and also at the same time, we give the awards along with that. And that's a kind of creates a lot of buzz in the, in the ships and we find a lot of uh, entries coming to us. And uh, we also put them in the pictures, everything in our newsletters, which go to the ship every month. So this is a kind of, uh, we are trying to encourage them that they, there should be some social activity at any given point and then they are involved with them. There is a uh, kind of more rapport within themselves. Yeah, that's what we are trying to do. I think that's really interesting because by creating that that challenge or competition on right. board, you yes. you bring out um, the fun part of, yes. of being social, and and it motivates people to absolutely, to, absolutely. In, to interact. And then the amount of enthusiasm it creates, uh, the lot of uh, entries become, and it's overwhelming. So it's, it indicates that they love these kind of uh, uh, competitions and to participate in yeah, them. And the awards are given and then uh, we tell them to give the award to the person concerned, whoever got the award, and take the picture and we distribute all around. Yeah, like indeed. That. Now I am going to come to this, um, I don't know, bombshell question. <laughs> um, it's always quite an interesting debate when we talk about dry ships. We all know the reasons why. There's been quite a lot of bad apples uh, previously. We all know that it is on a charterer's requirement that a lot of the ships are, are dry. And uh, Captain Peng talked about it in, in uh, his presentation earlier. How can you have chicken wings without having a proper beer? Uh, which is really an interesting, an interesting point. Um, from a club perspective, we in a way, we, we, we sometimes see the flip side of dry ships where the seafarer goes ashore in port and then gets smashed and <laughs> smashes up things on his way back to the ship and equally causes a lot of problems. So is that the solution? Should we go um, that way so that you, we all keep a dry ship and let them smash everything up on the shore side? That doesn't help either. So how can we find this, this balance between um, being able to, to have a beer? How can we convince, uh, or a wine, I prefer a glass of wine, but how can we convince the charterers that the days of those bad apples are such with, behind us now? And if I come back to you, Ms. Sika, from, from your perspective, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on providing soft, soft, I'm not talking hard liquors here. Let's, let's not go the whiskey route. Um, <laughs> I've, I have a lot of stories to tell about that. But what are your thoughts about soft uh, drink, but soft I alcohol? I don't know what are the soft drinks. Which Be beer, beer and uh, wine, okay. basically. Okay. Um, well, uh, we are a 25 year old company and we have been always following no alcohol, zero alcohol on board. And when you're talking about incidents, I do not know those guys, whether they're from the ship where alcohol allowed or not allowed, because that group of people who can create nuisance after drinking could be from anywhere. So, but from our experience, we find that uh, not giving alcohol is not really an essential for their good way, good, uh, their good being, right? Uh, so for their health, um, I don't think it is a kind of essential that they should have this, but so far as our experience is concerned, with our death, and we are limiting any kind of incident related to alcohol and drug and alcohol policy is very strict. This is interesting, and, and I'm going to go to the other perspective now uh, <laughs> to provide a counterpoint here. Um, Captain Peng, your thoughts? Uh, with, with due respect to uh, Muslim colleagues here in our SC, and those cannot drink for health reason. <laughs> okay. Personally, uh, I think it's necessary to have light alcoholic drinks and boot. And we have been drinking. <laughs> we have not uh, put ourselves into too much trouble. Uh, we have a very clear policy and procedure, and that is controlled by the master. And it's well understood by everybody. 
right? You go beyond that, you go, right? And it's a, uh, you know, some something we 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 like, we enjoy, and uh, you know, we keep our promise. And we do random echo tests with our ships. Call any time and ask them to do a test to show them that we are serious about business, so they know about that. And 99% of them abide by it. Yes, we had incidents, but isolated incidents, but we have not had any big problem. So everybody likes it, and I think we're gonna continue until you know, we have a different result from the pool. We did uh, a pool survey a few years ago, uh, close to 60% of our colleagues decided to keep light alcohol and uh, that was agreed by us in the office and approved by the CEO best days uh, as what I mentioned just now the seafarers on board like we will they're professionals they're adults like we are as long as their boundaries clear guidelines that will be observed will be abided I think it's necessary personally Thank you. It's, it's an interesting, uh, different viewpoint on this. And, and let me go to the doctor in the house here. Um, Dr. Faisal, how is alcohol giving us a positive or a bad negative influence on, on our well-being? Right. Um, asking a question of, from someone who doesn't drink. <laughs> but anyway, um, but there are medical literatures, I mean, I mean published out there, that, that has a positive correlation between drinking moderate amounts of wine uh, with cardiovascular protection, right? So that's a medical, medical point of view. Socially, I think, um, again, maybe a, a PME uh, question could be inserted to assess someone's alcohol dependence, to assess the risk should there be uh, exposed to, you know, the, the various policy of uh, dry ship versus non-one, I mean, alcohol-based ones. Um, so that's one, one point. Um, but um, I'm just, I just want to share that sometimes these are very important things that, that really prevent uh, or rather help them with their mental well-being. Because when I, I was involved in a 10-month-long uh, COVID project in Bangladesh, where we had to quarantine uh, migrant workers coming into Singapore for anything from 14 to 21 uh, days, and they were living in solitary rooms, right? And we had to, I had to make that judgment call to allow them to smoke. And that is against the doctor's uh, ethics, right? But thinking about it in the long term, because we are dealing with quarantine facility that's high, that's risky, we, we, we decided that, okay, that, that we can allow some cigarettes being brought in, Right, it is necessary socially, maybe, but we have like uh, what Dr. Ping, um, uh, Captain Ping mentioned, strict policy and procedures. You've got limited number of sticks to be able to be brought in, uh, limited duration of using it, and we do a lot of, uh, you know, we were serious about it. So we go our rounds and have a look. So similarly, if there are sim you know, certain kind of co command and control of, of governance with regards to this, I think it's safe. And it just helps both in the, uh, in, in the so-called medical point of view and also socially. Yeah, but that would be the, the wine though. The beers will increase the sugars. <laughs> if, if I can just jump in, Eve. Yes, I'm Harry. surprised this, first of all, this question got only 18 votes. First of all, this question got only 18 votes. Um, <laughs> secondly, if it was really a problem, then wouldn't it be a statutory requirement that, you know, there is no alcohol? Now, suddenly the expert in the charter becomes even more qualified than a doctor to start dictating terms to seafarers. I mean, as it is, we have enough bones of contention that everything, the seafarers, basically everybody's uh, tail to wag, you know, finally the buck stops here and now everyone starts dictating what he does on board. And on top of that, you want him to be happy. Oh, really, you know. I think this, <laughs> there's going to be a lot I of can, the masters. I may of, add it there. This policy which we have taken uh, uh, following this for last two, more than two decades, it's not under uh, any, any advice of anybody else. It is our own decision because we think there is a benefit out of it than the negative. So I think it's working for us and I cannot talk about others, but definitely for executive, it's working very well. Um, I don't think there is a right or a wrong in this. I think every company makes the decision. They do the risk assessment for the, their own particular type of, of trade and that ships that they are in. 
So I don't think there is a right or a wrong as such. Um, but I thought it was an interesting discussion that we, that we had on, on this topic. And yeah, why only 18 votes? Huh? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Can we also vote? <laughs> okay. Um, I, had, I saw one question here, um, which has 27 votes. Problem is that I can't mm. read it um, all the way. Ah, okay. How would the panel suggest ways to improve mental health and well-being of seafarers? I think we briefly touched on, on, on this earlier. How can we recognize the issue of, of um, mental health and well-being? So I think we would have answered that. Is there anybody that would want to comment on, on this I, question? I have one point on this now. Um, ISWAN, especially since they're quite, they do a lot of work in this. I saw it recently on social media. ISWAN actually have a course for uh, first aiders, mental first aiders, and they are calling on people to actually come to uh, undergo training to recognize because that was a topic. Uh, similarly, they also, ISWAN also has a seafarer wellness app. I know people rule eyes, one more app kind of thing, but um, there is a seafarers app which actually you all can download. And uh, these are actually put together by es experts who uh, say what you can do. I mean, it's not just about listening to good music and the sound of waves and the trees and the branches, but there's a lot of things like you can do as meditation, yoga, food and health tips, it, it all contributes and these come from them. So there are free apps like the ICE one, one, sorry, I'm not marketing for them, but still uh, I am. <laughs> but yeah. these are ways actually they can use to, um, you know, uh, get more information. Ms. Sika. Yeah, uh, I forgot to mention about this, about the yoga is, I think is a very good uh, uh, switch we actually encourage and they've been trained, all our cadets and all officers are trained on this so that they can practice it on board as well. I think it is really the importance is, is making the seafarers aware of what the various options are. Some people will prefer the yoga way, some people will prefer um, a beer, or, or every person also has their own preference on, on how they can. But at least if they know all the options that are, that are available to them, I think that would be a good first step. Now, what I, what, I was, um, what I came across, actually, when I was preparing for this, is that the Singapore Registry um, has introduced a number of additional notations. And I think it was touched upon yesterday. I, I, I heard it also, somebody mentioning it. Um, so these are four voluntary additional notations that you can have if you have a Singapore flag. Um, one is for green um, shipping, one is for the cyber uh, prevention, one is on smart ships, and one is on welfare. Um, I don't know the exact criteria of it, but what I do know is that so far only two ships have been awarded the welfare category, the welfare notation under this, under this new system. Now, and this came in place from, from 1st of November last year, so either the criteria for the MPA is having are really tough, or people are not aware that this is a notation that might be available to them. So I think this is something quite, quite well done by the MPA. Sorry for promoting the MPA here. Um, it's really well done that they are putting these additional notations in place for a Singapore flag. Now, Nautical Institute um, wearing that hat, puts quite a lot of emphasis on training of seafarers. Uh, being a training charity, we, we really want to emphasize the training that is required or that is available in addition to what STCW is requiring. And of course, we want to focus on uh, cadets for that. They are our future. And on, on the training part, we don't want to focus purely on the technical knowledge. We need to be able to focus, and, and our Captain Andre, um, president of DNI, mentioned this yesterday during the opening session as well. We need to focus on the soft skills uh, for these seafarers. And quite coincidentally, um, Captain Andre as well wrote a publication about mentoring of seafarers on board of ships. And one of the main points that came out of, of that publication is that it does not take more than 10 minutes 
to do a simple mentoring on board of a ship, but share that knowledge that as a, as a senior person you have with the new generation that is, that is coming on. And Charles touched on this earlier when he was talking about how to be, to be a leader. Mm. It, it fits quite well into, into that. But if I hand it back over before, before I keep talking, um, Harry, what are your thoughts on mentoring and how can mentoring improve the, the safety culture on board? I think absolutely. I mean, mentoring is exactly what the doctor prescribed. Uh, not you, Faisal, sorry, <laughs> as we speak. So um, there's so much that the elder seafarers have gone through, um, you know, in terms of rudimentary uh, navigation, seamanship, etc. Without the technology, etc., they used to kind of make it work with bare hands kind of thing. Not exactly smoke signals, but... Um, and now the new generations have arrived on the cusp of technology. And a lot of them don't have to do the basics because it's all on a platter. So it's important that these stories are shared so that um, they, there's so much to learn from them when the chips are down, then uh, how people dealt with certain situations may be an extremely good learning curve. Um, we do a lot of mentoring, I mean, as a nautical institute, Eves, myself, um, we undertake a lot of mentoring sessions and it's, it's all about giving, you know, and we go to the, uh, to the polytechnics, the maritime academies, and we talk to the cadets, we talk to post-sea uh, officers, there's so much to be done. And I think Captain uh, Andre Lagubin's book is fantastic. If you haven't, I would strongly advise that you all get hold of a copy and uh, go through it. But it's, I mean, he, even yesterday in his few moments of speaking, he was like, fantastic, a very simple solution. Just put two cadets on board every ship and then you've trained the people, you've solved the problem of cadets waiting and you know, uh, you're solving a lot of things. It could be as simple as that. But yeah, mentoring is as simple as having uh, just striking an interesting conversation, something you can actually gain from an intellectual conversation. Um, and um, it's not a top-down approach. Many people like to think of mentoring as that kind of uh, master-slave treatment where the person, I'm the plethora of knowledge and I'm going to like kind of, you know, uh, fine-tune your thinking and then when I say raise your hand, raise your hand, it's not going to be that. It's just a conversation. We've undergone mentoring sessions. We give mentoring sessions. We give mentoring sessions at the same time we are also undergoing mentoring sessions on other aspects so it's always that circle of life that is never complete so um, i think it's fantastic um, if you all are at uh, a loss of ideas about mentoring for your seafarers and all that just get in touch with the nautical institute we undertake a lot of that for the community thank you harry um earlier on captain peng was talking about the communication in his in his opening um, talk um, and it, it's a difficult topic there because you, I, I mentioned it earlier, the more communication you allow with the family at home, the happier the seafarer might be. Um, but also how the, the risk is there that all the problems from the shore side are coming to the seafarer. So one of the things there that I'm, that I'm wondering about, if, if there is something that can be done, and, and I think you referred, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to repeat it if, if I uh, can, what, what can we do to try and have a, the family have a better understanding of the life that the seafarer has and what, what are the good things that can be told and what are the things that maybe should get filtered? Uh, with uh, uh, connectivity today, um, you know, the seafarers are well informed of what is happening at home and uh, in the local community from the friends. Uh, so there's no way can, we, we can bring this back. We can reverse it. But I think it's very important to let the family and friends, uh, parents have better understanding of the life on board, the challenges they face, the problems they deal with every single day. Uh, so some of the stuff I have seen, I have experienced, I have benefited in the past is wife's club, carriage of family on board for short voyages and allow the family to have a deep understanding of the operation on board, uh, the tough life faced by the husband or the spouse. I had been benefited from this. Uh, you know, I have seen the wife's club organized by, you know, my perverse employer and the current company. 
uh, the wives come together uh, for events, discuss the challenges they have to support each other, to better understand the husband's job and challenges they have at sea, so they don't necessarily uh, you know, cause negative impact to the husband at sea uh, when they are busy keeping watch and, you know. Uh, you can imagine that if without even basic understanding, uh, the wife would not understand that the husband is in different time zone, right? And probably he's resting and then you're going to lag about uh, the kids being lotty and you want a solution from him and all this is going to uh, have very negative impact to the husband at sea. We have there was a very unfortunate incident. Uh, the captain locked himself in a cabin for five days. It's just because of an email from his, his wife. And he's not a young person, he was in his 50s. Eventually he signed off in Maldives and uh, you know, he really felt sorry about what happened and his behavior. And in these five days, he finished five cases, uh, sorry, uh, one case of beer and five bottles of whiskey. So I think more should be done to make sure that the message uh, clearly communicated with the family, they have good understanding, so they can support uh, the spouse at sea in a meaningful way, uh, as well as the kids. Right? It's tough uh, to have the husband away and to support a whole family just by the wife itself. So, uh, you know, Wives Club is one of the solutions to have the wives from local community gather together to share the concerns, to share knowledges, uh, you know, so they can better support the husband. Thank you. If I can come to Charles, um, do you have any comments or any further thoughts on, on how we can improve the family well-being? Mm -hmm. I think hearing that, what you just said was a beautiful thing, especially social support, 100%, right up my street. Uh, the more the families understand the, the challenges of seafarers, the better they can maybe adjust their communication patterns. But also learning about communication can help these families, right? How can we communicate? Maybe what are we communicating? And more importantly, uh, how are we communicating? Which will affect the seafarer most profoundly, right? Mm. I'm not a big fan of, of, of micromanaging seafarers. I think there's, this change has happened. They're connected to their families and they want to know what's going on at home. And now the environment has to assimilate and adjust to this. That's just the way it is. That's reality. We need to accept that. Mm. Seafarers like to know what's going on. They like transparency. And even if some things are filtered, because they know each other so well, they might worry anyway because they sense something's not being said. So I always believe in transparency and honesty. And I believe that we should make, uh, it shouldn't be us, it shouldn't be the shipping companies, it should be the families and wives or the husbands making those decisions on what can that individual deal with at sea. They are the experts of their partners. They should decide, should he know this or will I tell him once he gets home? Because ultimately, they know this person. They know what he or she can deal with. So I'm a big fan of giving the responsibility to those people who know them best, the actual experts, but offering exactly what you said, the social support, where they can get support and other opinions, and offering communication uh, advice on maybe how to communicate a little bit more sensitively or to realize certain things may be sensitive in nature. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to take, we have five minutes left. I'm going to take one of the slightly more controversial or more difficult questions uh, that has come in. And this is from a deck cadet, which I really find uh, really good. Um, and we touched upon this earlier. We, we've spoken about bullying. We've spoken about uh, all these things. But is there something um, that we can do on, on safeguarding the female seafarer or, or cadet, or it, it doesn't matter, any seafarer for that matter? Ms. Sika, I'm, I'm going to come to you on, on this topic, if I may. Yeah, actually, we started taking uh, female cadets uh, just about a year or two, and um, we had done a complete preparation for it. 
the selection for the, the these uh, female cadets was uh, very uh, uh, thought about, and uh, we definitely wanted the uh, the female cadets who were really really keen about joining this profession. Um, they went through the uh, the the test, which are meant for the male, the same, but they, theirs was especially about their family background, whether they are definitely going to, because they are go, definitely going to face a different situation on board. And after that, we, we kind of uh, prepared the ships where they are going to be put on board. We had counsel, we had the senior officers on board before they went on board. Uh, with our psychologists. So the proper uh, uh, preparation was done so that the female cadets, when they go on board, they are prepared to face the situation. And they are very closely monitored. Plus, we have two female uh, mentors. They're one master mariner and one chief engineer. They're the faculty for our training institute. They are the direct uh, 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 mentor for these uh, girls who are on board. So, so far we have found that whoever has gone on board, because I personally keep track of this, and the uh, superintendents where they've gone, I have got the feedback, these cadets are the better than the boys even who are on board. So we have no, we have seen to it that the possible situation they may face about the sexism and all, they were already negated. We prepared the ground for them, and we think we will, we were going to have uh, any more, no more problem as far as a girl could, etc. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Captain Peng. Uh, if I can add, I think uh, this is not only for female cadets, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. I have seen it myself. Uh, so I, I think education is the key to make sure that, uh, you know, the company, uh, as what you mentioned just now, have a very uh, robust procedure and policy to make sure that everybody is protected against uh, harassment. I think that is really important. It doesn't. We hear about the stories for for female uh, seafarers, but it is it's not limited to that. It it, it goes way beyond uh, beyond that. And thank you very much for for this deck cadet for sending in this this question. Um, I also love my timer because it has suddenly jumped up with five minutes. <laughs> uh, really interesting. Um, which other question can I do? Dr. Faisal, I'm going to come to you. Um, a more, we've talked about physical, we've talked about mental, we've talked about social, family well-being. Um, how can we tie it all together if, if we look at this from, from a holistic uh, perspective? What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, there's a very... Uh... Big question, but, but it's easily answered because I think this concept of uh, providing the best health uh, management that we can is not just for the seafarers, it's for any working community, it's part of occupational health, it's part of public health as well, right? So, but, but peculiar to the seafaring community, I mean, because of the inherent challenges, I think, um, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's always scope to, to Emphasis or focus on, on ensuring that you try and get the most optimum, healthy and fit uh, seafarer wherever possible. But that does not uh, disallow those who are not fit at that point to be coming on as seafarer in the future, right? I mean, there is always room for them to be optimized. So this is a pre-employment scope that, that, that might need to be you know, uh, enhanced, where there is capability of filtering and tiering and also some form of um, uh, optimization for them to come back and not deny them of the chance to work. So that's important. That's part of occupational health as well. And the next step when they are already on board on the vessel, um, the management of health, physically, mental or social, I think um, right now there are capabilities. I'm glad to hear that uh, the different shipping agencies are, are putting a lot of thought in, in this. Um, but like I said, I think we have scope to develop this because collaboration is not competition, like what we mentioned yesterday. So we want to make sure that everybody's seafaring community is healthy. So telemedicine uh, and te uh, what we call medical continuity is, is key. And that can only work if you have a good um, 
uh, I mean, working uh, partner in terms of a medical provider, telecoms provider, and even the local legislation. Because sometimes you might think that it is easy for us to deliver medicine, but because of you know uh, policies in terms of international borders and and whatnot, may may make legislation uh, you know a, a barrier to, to to enabling this. So that has to come in in terms of policy as well, right? So in a nutshell, I think, um, uh, uh, and, and of course the last part of course the social well-being. I think competition, connectivity, family support, all well and good. But I think uh, again, maybe as part of, uh, I mean, I don't know, this, this, I'm, I'm not clear, but I, I, I hope that the uh, there's continual assessment of an already onboarded seafarer to make sure that they're still at the pink of health, both mental and physical, right? It's not just a one-off assessment at the point of onboarding, but but maybe a few, I mean, I'm sure there are a few rounds of, of checks, but I think the emphasis on health, mental health as well, being assessed at that point, I think is key. Because it's a snapshot of that person's health. It's not, it's not a, a, a chronic diagnosis, right? I mean, Charles, you might, may, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a snapshot of what his mental state is in. And, and if maybe at the beginning he's fine, but because of the, the, the whole uh, uh, journey at sea for a few months, and he, you know, when you reassess him, he might show some signals that we might need to address early. So there is preventive health, right, a, a component in this. So I think this is the whole holistic management that we need to focus on, and it can only work if there's partnership between shipping companies, I mean, legislation bodies and medical providers that can enable this. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Mm. I, I'm going to take this uh, first question um, because it received 25 votes. How can we treat seafarers more important? Uh, how can we treat seafarers being frontline workers and they are facilitating the world trade? Ah, okay. How can we treat seafarers more importantly because they are frontline workers and they are facilitating the world trade? Thanks for this question, uh, Captain Rashid, but I'm not sure what we can answer on this from, from a panel perspective. I wanted to put it up because it has a lot of, of votes. Um, this is something that, that the flag states need to work on, that, that the port states need to, to work on. And I think from, from a Singapore perspective, um, that really has been done quite, quite clearly. Okay. Uh, Singapore has put seafarers as frontline workers. I do agree that it is not the same in all ports around the world, and I think a lot more can be done on this topic um, before, hopefully not too soon, the next uh, crisis comes around. Um, it, what I found quite sad is that it, it took the, the ever given to get stuck in the Suez Canal before the world basically woke up to the fact that all their goods arrive by ship. Um, I found that quite sad that it had to take that much of an of an incident for people to realize the importance of seafarers, but I don't need to tell you guys this. Um, so if I then move on, I have two more minutes. I can do this last question, which I thought was an interesting one as well before we close. Um, how can we deal with the increase in workload? And, and Captain Peng, earlier you mentioned you have a 10,000 TEU ship with uh, 13 crew on board? Uh, not as. Uh, sorry? Uh, not PL. Ah, not PL. Sorry, I thought it was one of yours. So there is a 10,000 TEU ship with only 13 crew on board. Um, that must increase the workload on, on those crew that are there uh, that may have adverse effects. What, what can we do on this? And, and I'll come back to you for your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a problem faced by most operators today, right? You have the balance, you want to uh, shorten the time in port uh, and make sure the ship is productive and go to CSAP. And uh, when you go to a dock, you try to maximize the time you have and then you can bring the ship out and earn money, right? That's what the ship's built for. Uh, I think we need to strike a balance uh, we have a clear understanding from the management that uh, probably it's a little bit more expensive to do repairs and uh, maintenance when the ship is in operation because uh, by the crew themselves, the, the work can be done is very much limited. 
So you need to have short teams. So we have done many times in Singapore, uh, in the past in China. So you bring a team of 15, 20 guys go on board to maximize the time input and uh, get maintenance done. So you reduce the, the workload of, uh, of the crew during the voyage because uh, they may face bad weather. You know, some of the guys may you know, not feeling very well. Uh, and you have very limited resource. So by doing so, you take part of the workload of the crew members so that they can concentrate on important task navigation to ensure safety and well-being of everybody. Uh, I think there's no golden rule, but uh, you know, the operator, the manager has to decide what is best for, uh, for the ship and uh, for the company, for the crew members. Yep. And I'll, I'll, I'll close on, on that statement by saying that we, we all know we have safe manning, minimum safe manning certificates in place. Um, those requirements are to sail the ship from point A to point B. They do not include the requirements for the active cargo handling, for the maintenance, and on some flag states, even your food is not included in your minimum safe manning certificate. Um, so that is something I feel that really should uh, be emphasized that it's not a goal to, to reach uh, a minimum safe manning. It's a minimum you should have on board. Now, thank you very much to everyone for submitting the questions. Um, thank you very much to all the, the crew that was listening in on board of, of the ships. I thought that was really interesting. Um, thank you very much to all of my panelists here for the very engaging uh, discussion. And thank you very much for this. Thank you. We really appreciate um, having, you know, deep dived in some of the topics that you have brought your expertise and brought to the front line to our awareness as well. We'd like to invite all of you to join us for a group photo, shall we? Since it's so nice to be gathered together in uh, face to face. Yeah, I think a stand up uh, shot for this one. It's really nice to be able to gather together. Thank you. I think it'd be great if we have a hashtag, right? You know, so we can document all these lovely photos. And thank you once again to our panelists, Dr. Kasim, Captain Subramaniam, Ms. Sika Singh, Mr. Charles Watkins, Captain Peng, as well as our moderator, Captain Eve Vanderborn, for taking us through that conversation. Um, that said, ladies and gentlemen, we also really appreciate all your participation. The questions got us thinking, and I hope the conversation doesn't stop here. As we move uh, on to the break time, uh, there are just two things that I'd like to bring to your attention. Could you please uh, join us uh, by taking a QR code uh, of the feedback form that will be coming up? That's right. While it's still fresh in your minds, we'd love to hear your feedback really quickly in the digital form that will help us uh, bring even better events to you. And also, we'd like to encourage you to participate in the quiz. Um, so your participation could win you a Amazon gift card worth Singapore $50. So we hope that makes it a fruitful time for you to join us in this quiz. And at the same time, I'm very pleased to announce to you after this, uh, you can actually adjourn to the back of the hall. Tea time will be served. It'll be a 30-minute break for you to stretch your legs, which I think is important for learning as well. And we'll come back at 3.30 right back here for Plenary 2. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention and for joining us in the feedback and the quiz. We'll see you back shortly at this area. Enjoy your break time. <laughs>